Are you wondering how to pass your nursing school dosage calculation exam? Or do you worry about those med math problems every time that you take a test because you know that they're going to show up somewhere? Well, my friend, worry no more because in this video, I will be walking you through the simple six step process to getting every dosage calculation problem right every time on your nursing school exams. So hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell and let's dive in. All right, so before we get into the nitty gritty of solving dose calc problems, there's a few things that we need to agree on first. Number one, following our simple six step process is going to make all of the difference for you. I have seen nursing instructors teach dosage calculations in a lot of different ways and so many of them are really just confusing and just not helpful. That's why I created this step-by-step -step process. Now, when you follow these six simple steps that we will go over in a minute, you will get every dose calc question right. Just take it from our other students who love this dose calc system because it works, my friend. So please stick with these six simple steps and you will be golden. Now, the second thing that we need to agree on is that we are not, my friend, not going to memorize any formulas. I know, I know what you are thinking. Formulas is probably what you're using right now. And it's probably how your instructor teaches you. But here's the deal, my my friend, trying to memorize a random formulas might work for super basic dose calc problems, but it will fail you as you try to solve more complex problems. Problems like Pitocin calculations, heparin calculations, and where you have to use multiple conversion factors to get the right answer. So even though a formula might be working for you okay for now, as you progress in your program and need to solve more complex complex dose calc problems, you will run into major, major issues using formulas. I do not want you to get to your exam, have a bunch of random formulas memorized, and then realize that they don't work with the question that your dose calc exam is actually asking you, or you don't know which formula to use for which problem because there's just so many of them to remember. I see it happen all the time. Don't do that to yourself please. So instead, we use dimensional analysis, which is also called the railroad method or railroad tracks, which in my opinion is one thousand times easier and it works every time, no matter what problem that you are trying to solve. If you want more help with dimensional analysis and answering dosage calculation problems correctly, be sure to check out the Nursing SOS membership community where, of course, we have a full dose calc course for you with step-by-step -step videos and tons of practice problems as well. So if you're not quite confident with answering dose calc questions yet, it will help you so much. Now let's dive into what this step-by-step -step system looks like. And we'll walk through a dose calc problem as we go through it to help it all come together for you. Here's our practice problem. The physician ordered one liter of normal saline to infuse over a span of eight hours. The IV tubing that you're using is 20 drops per milliliter. How many drops per minute will be infused? So now that we have our practice problem, let's look at at how we set up every dose calc problem using the six simple steps. Now, the first step is to look at the problem and figure out what unit we need to end up with at the end. Is the question asking you how many milliliters per hour the patient will receive? Is it asking you how many drops per hour will be given? No, it's asking how many drops per minute will be infused. So step number one is to always read the question and figure out what you need to ultimately end up with at the end. That way, you know that you're solving for the right thing. You don't want to get to the end of your exam and realize that you misread the question and then got it wrong. So always make sure to start with the end in mind. What unit do you need to end up with at the end? And you'll write this unit on the right hand side of your paper. So for our practice problem here, the unit we need to end up with at the end of solving this dose calc problem is drops 
per minute. We are trying to figure out how many drops per minute will be given to our patient. Now, step number two is to look at the problem again and then see what the original order says. What was the doctor ordering? Did the doctor order a certain number of milligrams, maybe grams or milliliters or something else? So reread the question again and then look at what the order says. In our question, the physician ordered one liter of normal saline to infuse over a span of eight hours. That's what the order says. So on the left hand side of your paper, you will write what the doctor ordered. Now, in this case, we will write one liter over eight hours hours because we need to give one liter of fluid over an eight hour time frame. So you'll write it as one liter divided by eight hours. So now let's have a look at what we have. We need drops over minutes, but we currently only have liters over hours. So somehow we need to get from liters over hours to drops over minute. So this is where your conversion factors come into play. This is step number three. What conversions do you need to use to solve this problem? Now here's where most nursing students get stuck. When you look at a dose calc problem like this and you need to somehow go from liters over hours to drops over minutes, you kind of freeze and think, oh no, <laughs> I have no idea how to do this. I totally get it, my friend. I am a pro at freaking out when it comes to math. I promise you, <laughs> I am really not a math person by any stretch of the imagination. And that is why I love this six step process so much. It works every time. And when you lay it out this way, it's so much easier to visualize. So take a deep breath and let's look at this together. Now we know that we need to get from liters over hours to drops over minutes. Now the trick to dimensional analysis is that units need to cross themselves out. We need to eliminate them. So because we don't need to end up with liters over hours at the end, we somehow need to get rid of those units. And we do this by using conversion factors to cancel out those units. The unit that we want to end up with at the end must be aligned with these railroad tracks. So in our case here, we want to make sure that we end up with drops or GTTS on the top of our railroad track and minutes on the bottom of the railroad tracks. Now all other units need to cancel themselves out and I'll show you how to do that right now. So a trick I use when solving any dose count question is to look at the original problem and see if they give you any conversion factors first in that problem. So let's read it again. Now, the physician ordered one liter of normal saline to infuse over a span of eight hours. The IV tubing you're using is 20 drops per milliliter. How many drops per minute will be infused? Did you catch it? Do you see the conversion factor that the question actually gives us? We already know what we need, drops per minute, and we already know what the order is, one liter over eight hours. So that leaves us that IV tubing conversion. The IV tubing gives 20 drops per milliliter. Bingo. So let's write that in the middle and see what happens. So now we have one liter over eight hours, 20 drops over one milliliter. And at the end, we have drops over minutes. Now this is good because we have drops or GTTS on the top of the railroad tracks, right where it needs to be. Now remember, whatever unit we want to end up with at the end on top is what needs to be on the top of the railroad tracks. And whatever unit we need to end up with on the bottom at the end is what needs to be on the bottom of the railroad tracks. But now there's still a problem. We still have the units of liters, milliliters, and hours to get rid of. We don't need to end up with those at the end. And we somehow need to get minutes on the bottom. So let's look at where we're at again. Now, liter over hours, drops over milliliters. We want to keep the drops because that unit needs to stay until the end. We need that one on the top of the railroad tracks, but we need to get rid of the liters and the milliliters. So what's another conversion that we could use? The easiest one will be this. There are 1000 milliliters in one liter. 
So 1,000 milliliters over one liter. When we write that in, let's see what happens. We have milliliters on both the top and bottom of our railroad tracks, so they cancel each other out. And we have liters on both the top and the bottom of our railroad tracks, so those can cancel each other out too. Any unit that is on both the top and the bottom of the railroad tracks cancels each other out. So now what are we left with? We now have one over eight hours, 20 drops over one, and 1,000 over one. The other units are canceled. So drops is still on the top of the tracks where it needs to be. We didn't cancel that one out. And we still have hours on the bottom that we need to somehow convert to minutes. Why? Because we need to end up with minutes at the end of the problem. So let's do that next. How can we get from hours to minutes? What conversion factor can you think of? Well, there's 60 minutes in one hour, right? So 60 minutes over one hour or one hour over 60 minutes. Do we need to write it as 60 minutes over one hour or one hour over 60 minutes? If we leave it as 60 minutes over one hour, then minutes will be on the top of the railroad tracks and that's not where we want it. We need it on the bottom. So we'll need to write it as one hour over 60 minutes. Now that puts minutes on the bottom where it needs to be. And now we have hours on the bottom here and hours on the top here, and those can cancel each other out. So remember those two principles of dimensional analysis that we talked about. When you write a unit on both the top and the bottom of the railroad tracks, they will cancel each other out. And principle number two, whatever unit you want to end up with at the end on the top needs to be on the top of the railroad track. And whatever unit you need to end up with at the end on the bottom needs to be on the bottom of the railroad track. Now, don't be afraid to play around with these conversion factors if you need to. There has been many a time where I needed to put in a conversion factor and see if it works and then erase it if it doesn't. So sometimes you just need to use the good old fashioned trial and error process if you're really not sure what conversion factors to use. So don't be afraid to try different ones, put them in different places to see what works. So now that we have all of our conversion factors in place, they look good and we ended up with the right units on the top and the bottom of the tracks. Now we need to multiply it. So step number four is to just multiply straight across the top of the railroad tracks and then multiply straight across the bottom of the railroad tracks and then divide those two numbers. So let's do it. One times 20 times 1,000 times one equals 20,000 and eight times one times one times 60 equals 480. So now that we've multiplied across the top and the bottom of the tracks, we need to divide now those two numbers. So 20,000 divided by 480 is 41.6. So 41.6 drops per minute is what we have now. So now let's move on to step number five, which is to use the correct rounding rules and the rules for zeros. So anytime we have, uh, we are writing out drops per minute, it will always be a whole number. When you're looking at your IV tubing and counting the drops manually in that drip chamber, are you able to count out 0 0.6 of a drop. No, you are definitely not. <laughs> so we always round drops per minute to a whole number. So in this case, 41.6 drops per minute would become 42 drops per minute. Now remember this rounding rule, five and above and you round up, four and below you round down. So because we had 0.6 of a drop, it's greater than five. So we need to round up to the next whole number which would be 42. So the answer is 42 drops per minute. And step number six is to, of course, double check your math, rework the problem again to make sure that you got it correct. Dosage calculations are really, really important to get right every time. It can literally mean life or death for a patient. So it's always important to double check yourself and to make sure that you got the correct answer. Now, my friend, there are three ways that I can help you more with dose calc in nursing school. Number 
one, download this free cheat sheet that walks you through the step-by-step -step process for acing dose calc. Now don't miss out on that free resource for you. Now number two, get the nursing school dose calc box so you can snag the flashcards, get the full workbook and practice problems and all the other goodies that come in that box to help you build confidence and pass your dose calc exam. And of course, as always, if you want me to hold your hand throughout nursing school, please don't miss out on joining the nursing SOS membership community. It is filled with step-by-step -step nursing lectures to help you understand everything faster, including a full dose calc course with additional practice questions for you to go through. Plus, you will get access to our fantastic nurses so you can ask questions anytime that you get stuck. We are here to help. Now, the links to all of those things are in the description down below. And if you like this video, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment below to let me know that it was helpful for you if you liked this step-by-step -step process and want more videos like this. And of course, click that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. And click on one of these videos right over here so you can keep rocking nursing school. And as always, my friend, go become the nurse that God created only you to be. And I'll see you next time on the Nursing School Show. Take care. Bye-bye.